This holiday season, you might be looking for nutritious, convenient meals to keep you energized on jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, can help you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian-approved, ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while tackling all your holiday to-dos. Too busy with holiday plans to cook, but want to make sure you're eating well? With Factor, skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up too, while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality you need. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy. When you're too busy running around to plan lunch, Factor has you covered with lunch to go. Effortless, wholesome meals like grain bowls and salad toppers that are ready to eat when you're on the go, no microwave required. Head to factormeals.com slash MC911pod50 and use code MC911pod50 to get 50% off. That's code MC911pod50 at factormeals.com slash MC911pod50 to get 50% off. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Whether your resolution is to save money, eat better, or stress less, HelloFresh is here to help you do all three. Say hello to your most delicious year yet with fresh ingredients and chef-crafted recipes at a price you'll like delivered right to your door. So you've resolved to actually sit down and eat dinner around the table, but what do you do about those nights when your schedule is packed? Turn to HelloFresh's lineup of quick and easy meals, including their 15-minute recipes designed to help minimize mealtime stress. Every single meal I've had from HelloFresh has had easy-to-follow instructions, fresh ingredients, and when it's done, I feel like I'm out at my favorite restaurant. Go to HelloFresh.com slash MC911free and use code MC911free for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash MC911free with code MC911free. Workplace disputes are a common occurrence, but they can sometimes escalate to violence. This can have devastating consequences for the victim the perpetrator, and the workplace as a whole. There are many factors that can contribute to workplace violence, including job stress, long hours, high workloads, and unrealistic deadlines. They can all lead to job stress. This can make employees feel frustrated, angry, irritable, all of which can increase the risk of violence. It also can stem from personal problems. Employees who are experiencing a personal problem, such as financial difficulties or relationship problems, they may be more likely to lash out at others in the workplace. Alcohol and drug abuse can impair judgment and decision-making, making it more likely that someone will act violently. And people who have a previous history of violence, either in the workplace or in their personal lives, are more likely to commit violence again. Some of the ways that workplace violence can show its face are verbal abuse, stalking, cyberbullying, and then actual physical violence that can be an assault, battery, or even murder. And the devastating effects of workplace violence can affect the victims as well as other co-workers. They may experience physical injuries, emotional trauma, or even PTSD. They may also miss work, which can lead to financial hardship. The workplace itself may also suffer as employees may become afraid to come to work or productivity may decline. If you haven't figured it out yet, this episode I'll be talking about a workplace dispute that took an incredibly sideways wrong turn and ended up with a deadly outcome. Welcome back to Music City 911. This episode is going to start out a little differently than most others. At this point, I'd usually start up with a 911 call. 
the call or calls leading up to the incident I'll be talking about today weren't released. So I'll need to bring y'all up to speed on what happened prior to the calls I have. Uly, Florida is a small community just north of Jacksonville off Interstate 95 and State Highway 17 and is considered part of the Jacksonville metro area. It's a suburb where most of the people who live there drive into Jacksonville for work each day. Even though it's a pretty small community, they still have larger stores like your typical restaurants and grocery stores and even a Walmart. On a Tuesday night around 5.15 p.m. back in 2014, 53-year-old Stephen Swan was walking in the parking lot of the Walmart when he was hit by a car. Unknown to him, it wasn't an accident. It was deliberate. After being hit by the vehicle, the driver got out and started beating Stephen, hitting and kicking him repeatedly. Security guards at the Walmart rushed out to try and help the victim as well as detain the suspect, but the attacker managed to get back in his car and flee the scene. Luckily for police, witnesses of the attack hopped in their cars and followed the suspect. Surveillance video showed that three witnesses followed the fleeing suspect. One was named Kyle Davis, a former military member. He was quoted as saying, First thing I noticed was the car on the side. The next thing I noticed were the looks in people's faces that were panicked. I saw the car on the side of Walmart starting to speed off. He went on to say, As soon as I noticed he was speeding off, I cut through the parking lot, probably through four or five lines, speeding as fast as I could trying to intercept the car, and he ran through the stop sign at such a high speed he hit a curb. Davis followed the suspect's vehicle to a nearby neighborhood where things kicked up a notch. He saw the vehicle he was following stop and then a man hop out and run into a house. Davis then told reporters, I heard four to six shots, and when we heard the shots, we went to the next door neighbors. Then we called the cops and held up there until the cops arrived. Luckily, none of the witnesses that followed the suspect were hit by the gunfire. Back at Walmart, EMS were called to the scene to attempt to help Stephen Swan. He was loaded into an ambulance, but was injured so badly that he was taken to an awaiting helicopter and airlifted to the University of Florida Health Hospital where a few hours after he arrived, he passed away. After receiving the calls from the witnesses that followed the suspect, police showed up at an address on Arrigo Boulevard in the Fernandina Beach area where they too began taking gunshots from the suspect after he barricaded himself inside the house, at first with a handgun, then he transitioned to long guns. A perimeter was set up surrounding the house and a SWAT team from Jacksonville was called to help in negotiations as well as try to resolve the incident if it continued down the path it looked like it was going to. That's when dispatch got another 911 call, this being a very long call that I believe is important to hear in its entirety. 911, where is your emergency? Nassau County 911, where is your emergency? Hello? Nassau County 911, where is your emergency? Hello? You there? I'm here. What is your emergency? There's no emergency. I'm at a standoff with the police on Rigo Boulevard. Okay, and what is your name? Alan Fortune. Okay, Alan, what's going on? Lisa. Are you the one... Are you the one that's shooting at the police, Alan? You bet. Okay. Why are you doing that? Well, it's a long story, sweetheart. Okay. Well, tell me what's going on, okay? I've got the shooter on the phone. In 2005, while I was employed at Quartz's Naval Shipyard. Okay. What happened at the Naval Shipyard? I had a... I had a supervisor that came after me and targeted me, and his name was Stephen G. Swan. Okay, and what happened with that? Well, this guy was trying to make a name for himself. S O A S O. And he went through the he went through the through the uh, craftsmanship. S O three. S O A. One name at a time, and please don't try to distract me. 
I'm armed, and I'm aware. SO3, SO8, go ahead. Okay, and so what? This guy kept coming after me and kept coming after me until eventually he got me laid off as a threat to the nation under the Patriot Act. Now, that lasted for about two years, and they gave me a retirement. Okay. But I didn't particularly care for... Uh, I didn't particularly care for uh, his deployment tactics. You see, this guy was a narcissistic individual who could get to do anything he could to get ahead. And I wasn't the only one that he targeted. Right. And in 2009, 2010, somewhere in there, the Navy filed charges against this guy. The Navy filed charges against him? The Navy filed charges against him and a man called Alan Beck. There's what, sir? And this is going to get real complicated. In the end, there was an investigation from a team came down from Atlanta. And uh, they did an investigation, and they gave two Alan Beck and Steve Swan two weeks off. The only thing that Mr. Beck, uh, Mr. Swan confessed to was Michael Manji. Now, this wasn't only Shop 38 at TRF. There was other shops involved, and there was other supervisors involved. And they all went on the beach with time off. But by then, I had been uh, in a leave-without-pay status. Now, some, of them, some people say I was crazy. Okay, fair enough. I could have spent the whole my whole rest of my life in uh, like silence, which would have proved them wrong. But I would have not got any restitution. Steve Swan was up for retirement. I went to Walmart at the end of the street and I saw him there, and I ran the son of a bitch over. Okay, so he was able to retire. Not not for another year. So he, you ran over him at Walmart today? Yes. You know what? What? This is really just happenstance. I didn't go looking for the guy. Right. But... You just the saw truth. him there? I saw him there. Okay, well, what can we do for you right now? You can listen to my story because I'm okay. a dead man anyway. Okay, well, I'm listening, okay? I want it all documented, and it's going to take a lot of time. If you tell the police to fucking pull back, I'll tell you my story, and this will end up happily. I won't be shooting at fucking officers again. But if next time I see a police officer draw a 40 millimeter, a 40 caliber sidearm on me again, I will shoot to kill. Okay, Mr. Fortuna? Yes. Okay. Um, the officers on the scene want you to come out the back door with your hands up. Fuck you, that ain't happening. Okay, we can, they want to resolve it and they want to hear your story. They're not resolving shit because in order to hear my story, I'm going to lose all my pensions and go to jail for life. So you might as well consider me suicidal. Okay, I'm listening. Okay, just keep talking, okay? Let me ask you something. There's a white pickup truck behind my behind the northeast corner of my house. Is there still an officer behind there? Um, I don't know, sir. I'm not. You don't? Well, I, we're going to find out. Okay. 
Mr. Okay. Fortuna, please yeah. don't, please don't fire any more shots. Okay. Uh -huh. Please do not fire your gun again. Well, I tell you what, tell them to back the fuck off and we'll end up in a resolution here. They can stand out at the street all they want, but if you're trying to fucking make time for them to maneuver in position, it's not going to happen. Okay, sir. So you're telling me you want them to back off to the street? That's absolutely right. Okay, all right. Hold on for me just a moment. Let me talk to the dispatcher, okay? Yeah. Lisa? Lisa? He says we're going to back off. He wants them back to the street, not to come near the And he's suicidal, is what he's saying. You there? I'm here. I'm here. I, I told okay, the dispatcher that you want them to the street. Let's okay. get personal because I know how this works. What's your first name? My name is Linda. Hi, Linda. My name is Alan. Okay, Alan. <laughs> you know, I would like to try to help you resolve this and to work out whatever issues are going on, okay? No, you're not. No, I, I am. Pro no, you can't do anything. Judge Foster, he's a fucking asshole. You know what? I already went down his lane with a divorce. Okay. You know, the United States Air Force, these fucking people, you go look up William Holly and you go look up William Holly and ask him how come he was punching on me all the time and how come he never filled up my uh, performance reports. Who was he? William Holly. He was my supervisor out at the 125th Air Refueling Squadron. Were you in the Air Force? I was in the Air National Guard, but I was Air active duty Air Force. You point this out in your report there, darling. I got 50 years working for the United States government, and I am a two-time war veteran. You make sure that gets in there. Okay, I'm listening, Alan. I didn't know. I don't know how type you could fast, how type you, how fast you could type. <laughs> well, I probably can't type as fast as you can talk, but um, it's all right. It's all right. I am listening to your story. That's right. All right. You know, I never really wanted this to happen this way. Well, you know, you're you're the one that can. Make it happen no, no, a no, different no, way. No, 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 no. The United States government pushed me into a corner because they wanted to prove a point. And now I'm going to prove a point. And you need to look up a commanding officer called Leo Fadu. I don't know how to spell his last name, but he was the commanding officer of Triton Refit Facility in 2007. Actually, what's his last name, Fago? Fadu, F-A-D-E-A-U, or something like that. And who? Shouldn't be any, shouldn't be too much trouble. What base was he in command? You said Triton Refit Facility, Kings Bay, Georgia. Okay, and what about him? He was the one that supported this Steve Swan and all these other uh, shop supervisors for coming after uh, employees and trying to teach everybody a lesson. So he was com they were coming after other employees? Absolutely. Okay. In other words, Leo Fadu and the supervisors that were under his command created a hostile work environment. Okay. 
Okay, Alan, I'm still listening. Now, before I get too wound up on the Navy and the Air Force and everything else, I'm going to come after Judge Foster. Okay, and what do you mean when you say you're going to come after him? Well... I figure this is probably going to make the newspaper, so I might as well get the facts straight. I'm not going to come, I'm not going to come after him because there's no way I'm leaving, leaving this house alive. I know you're keying in on all those uh, negative thoughts. I'm going to kill myself and all this other stuff. Well, is that what you're saying, that you're going to kill yourself? Depends. What does it depend on? How this ends up. Okay, well, I'm going to ask you not to hurt anyone else. And I don't want you to hurt yourself either. Well, but it's very important. I can't, I can't, um, you know agree to the first part or second part, but I'll tell you, I'll, I'll go this way. I'm not going to hurt any civilians. This is between me and the police department. Now, they want to come out here with weapons drawn? Fine. Okay, so what are you saying exactly about the police? If there's any kind of a breach on this house, it's going to end badly. Okay, are you the only one inside? I'm not going to answer that question. Is anybody inside that's injured? No. Is there anybody inside with you that's in danger? Possibly. Let me go this way. You might as well start clearing the neighborhood because this house is fucking rigged for an explosion. What kind of explosion? I'm not going to tell you that, but it's directional. What does that mean? It's some sort of propellant or what? What are you talking about? i tell you what. i got 50 years all working for the military, mm -hmm. 27 as a civilian or nuclear subs, and 16 working for the Air Force. You figure it out. Okay. Well, I don't have military experience, so I don't well, really that's, know. That's unfortunate for you. I'm just going to tell you this. There's enough explosives in here right now where things are going to be very bad. And I know you call it SWAT. See, I know how this works, but you're never going to get back to Judge Foster, are you? You're trying to essay the surveillance, establish a perimeter. I got it. Okay. This is this is going to end up badly. Okay. Well, what when you say it's going to end badly, what what do you Good. mean? I tell you what. Use your imagination. Okay. Uh, well, I am, you know, but I just need a little help here, you know. I tell you what. Give me five minutes. Call me back. Come, well, come in here. It's going to turn into a fucking shootout. I'm on with the 223. What is your phone number? You should have it on file. Okay. 
He just hung up on me. He told me to give him five minutes and call him back. He said they better clear the neighborhood. There's going to be a big explosion, and it's going to be directional. It's not at all normal to have a police shootout with someone and the person shooting at the police then calls in a dispatch. And on the ultra rare occasion that it does happen, I can't remember any calls where the shooter is this calm. Before we get into what happened that day, let's take a look at what led up to all this craziness. The caller, 59-year-old Alan Fortunia, was a married man who began working at the Trident refit facilities on the Naval Submarine Base, Kings Bay, as a mechanic as well as a defense contractor in 1997. His immediate supervisor was Stephen Swan, the victim in the incident at Walmart. During the years working there, the working relationship was tumultuous, at least for Alan. While it's not exactly known what was happening there, if anything, Alan believed that Stephen was responsible for his demise there at the naval base. The problem with that thought, and others he may have had, he wasn't fired or laid off from his job like he said he was. He voluntarily retired in July of 2010. Even though it was possible that Stephen was somehow plotting the involuntary dismissal of Alan, it doesn't seem very likely. Stephen was seemingly universally liked by all. Statements were taken by police as well as news reporters about what kind of a person Stephen was. The base they had worked at released a statement saying, he was greatly admired throughout the entire command and a well-respected leader here. His passing has shocked and impacted everyone here and our thoughts and prayers go out to his family, friends, and co-workers. That was from Mark Turney, public affairs officer for Trident Refill Facility there at Kings Bay. David Lee, a friend and neighbor of Swan, remembered him as an excellent family person who was always outside with his kids. He said, I can't even fathom why someone would do this to him. Alan, on the other hand, had all sorts of previous problems. Divorced around 2005, but previous to that, local sheriffs had multiple calls for domestic violence at the residence. Also in 2005, he was served with a domestic violence injunction and was subsequently arrested for contempt of court because of it. He was also evicted from his home by his mortgage company in 2009. In 2007, he was Baker Acted, which for those of you in Florida may already know about. The Baker Act is an involuntary mental health committal. He was found to be suicidal with multiple suicide notes in his house and in possession of multiple weapons. One source I read from noted his weapons were given back to him after he was released but I couldn't find anything to confirm or deny that. Over the years, Alan's hatred and disdain for Stephen kept building. In 2012, the night of the incident we've been talking about, Alan had no plans to harm Stephen. As he described it, it was simply happenstance. For him, he saw it as the right place at the right time to end the life of someone he believed he had problems with and that was in a parking lot of a Walmart. Y'all heard his ramblings on that extended phone call. There were so many avenues he was going down during the call, giving reasons for what he was doing, giving warnings and threats to police there, one of which saying he had an explosive device inside the house. Normally, when they run the mill crazy person makes a statement like that, they don't know anything about explosives. They don't know how they're made, they're not really adept at how they function or made to function. And a lot of times, and this is arguably most important, they don't know what materials to source to make it. This suspect had worked for the military in various roles and had years and years of access to different bits of knowledge that will allow him to easily craft at least a basic explosive. And the threat he made on the phone of having one he certainly did have the capacity to make an explosive. This obviously is a huge concern for anyone there on the scene. Time goes by after the initial call from Alan, 
and I'm guessing the thought of what he had done started eating at him. Not so much that he had killed someone, but wanted to make sure he killed the right person. He called dispatch back. Do what, sir? 911? Yes. I said, let me talk to the person I was talking to before. I live on a Regal Boulevard. All right, hold on one second. Alan? Yeah. Hey, this is Linda. Hi, Linda. What's going on? I want you to do me a favor. I'm going to hang up. Okay. Again. Why? Because I want you to confirm to me that the person that I killed in the Walmart parking lot was Steve Swan. I, w- I can't live with myself if I thought I killed somebody that was, wasn't him. When you find that out, call me back. Okay. I should have had a wallet in his parking, in his pocket that would have identified him. All right, and tell me, what's his first name again? Just confirm it for me. Steve, S-T-E-D-E-N, Swan, S-W-A-N. Call me back. Okay, I'll call you back. Dispatch never heard from Alan again. As far as I know, they didn't call him back either. Not that you would have without careful thought by negotiators there at the scene. He wants to make sure the person he killed was, in fact, Stephen Swan. That sounds almost like a last request or some sort of, I need to know this before I go type thing. You don't want to be the catalyst to this man shooting officers, or worse, setting off an explosive that could kill multiple officers and maybe neighbors as well. Hours passed and no one heard from Alan. At around 11.20 p.m., a decision was made to breach the house and see what Alan had been up to. They found him with a self-inflicted gunshot wound, already dead. Alan was no longer a threat. His talk of an explosive device wasn't just a false threat either. He had set up a propane tank as a makeshift bomb. Luckily for those around the house, it didn't go off like he wanted to. I believe there at the end that he actually wanted to set it off with him inside taking as many people with him, but that didn't work. Even with his potential knowledge of explosives, the one he made was a dud. After failing to make his bomb explode, he took the only way out he could. Suicide. After scouring the home for evidence, multiple more suicidal notes were found, along with several guns he used to shoot at police. And to think, this all started over a possibly non-existent workplace dispute. Senseless violence that never needed to happen. Hope y'all enjoyed this episode. And if you did, consider helping out the show by hopping over to patreon.com slash musiccity911 for ad-free episodes and bonus content. I've recently uploaded an addition to the recent When Animals Attack episode that has some pretty incredible circumstances behind the outcome. It's definitely one you don't want to miss. If you like the show and want some more, Patreon's definitely the place to be. Other ways to help out the show, and this one is actually a bit more on the personal side, mainly because hours spent dispatching and recording episodes can really dry out my voice. Something that can help keep my vocal cords nice and relaxed is definitely a cold beer. On my website, musiccity911.com, if you scroll down towards the bottom of the main page, you can buy me a beer. That's just a one-time donation you can make in any amount you like. I promise that any donation there will go directly to proper fluid intake. Also, something that helps out the show is the continued five-star ratings and reviews on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. And the last thing before I go, if you work for any sort of first responder or military agency, I'm starting either a patch board or a patch wall, depending on how many I can get. Riverside, California, I've got yours already, and they're ready to be placed. I'd love to have one of the patches from your agency. So if you'd like to send me one, or if anyone wants to send anything else, after multiple requests for fan mail, I finally have something set up. You can send whatever you have to Music City 911, 1784 West Northfield Boulevard, PMB 371, 
That's PMB as in Paul Mary Boy 371, Murfreesboro, Tennessee 37129. I'll have that info in the show notes as well if you're anything like me and can't remember shit. Thank you all for listening and for your continued support. And until next time, for Music City 911, I'm Brandon, and y'all have a good one.